Hey, how fam? Welcome to our YouTube channel. Give us a thumbs up and subscribe so you can get new content each week. And we pray that you enjoy this message on today. Have you ever had those moments where it was, it was such short of a time that the only thing you could form out of your mouth in that moment was Jesus. I believe that this, this worship flow right here is so prophetic to what God wants to speak to us on today. And I wanted, I wanted to tee up this message in such a special way, but I don't want to ruin what God is already starting to lay the foundation. And I was thinking about as I was as I was worshiping over there about how there were there were two moments in my life where I went I was in car accidents two moments in my life where I didn't even have the time to form the word my mouth I couldn't even form and even say Jesus But he always has a way of showing up. The old folk used to say, right in the nick of time. There are times when we can call the name Jesus and there are times where our heart just and our spirit, our soul just cries out Jesus and he shows up right in the moment where you need him most. There were two moments in my life where when I was on my way home from school, I was in college and I was on my way home from school and I was working full time and going to school full time. I would work from 6 a.m. to 3 p.m. and then go to class, drive an hour to school and go to class from 4 p.m. to 10 p.m., drive home, study, get up and do it all again the next day. And there was a moment where I was completely exhausted. And I'm on my way home. And as I'm on my way home, I'm on Highway 85, leaving Greensboro, headed down to Durham, North Carolina. And while I'm on the road, I fall asleep. And as I fall asleep, the car starts to veer off and I wake up as I feel the car shifting and I overcorrect. Now I'm doing 80, 85 miles an hour. The car does a complete 180 and I'm now facing trucks. <laughs> I'm facing cars, I'm facing the oncoming traffic, 18 wheelers are facing me and I don't know how to explain it other than Jesus, it works because as I'm in drive, the car moves backwards off the side of the road. Not a hair on my head was singed. Not a scratch on the car I was driving. You see, the enemy will try to catch you in the times where you're most vulnerable. And he'll try to rob you of the promise and of the things that God has laid before you. But he cannot touch. Just as he told Job, he says, you can touch and do anything you want to around him, but don't touch him. That was one time. The second time, uh, 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 and some of y'all ain't going to want to ride with me after this, but the second time I'm on my way home from work and again I fall asleep on the road. This is now that the expense of being a bivocational pastor and going through uh, having church in the evening and conferences all day long and I go home, I leave work early because I'm tired. I acknowledged it at work and at 12 p.m. I said, y'all, I'm going home, I'm tired. And on the way home, I fall asleep and I run head on. I go left of center and run head on with traffic, it's asleep. I didn't wake up and say, whoa, I didn't have a chance to brace myself. I was awakened by the impact. Needless to say, my car was total, the car I hit was total, and the car that was behind that car was total, but nobody walked away with a scratch. I didn't have a scratch on my body. I, 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 I didn't have a, a single bone broken in my body. There was no laceration, there was nothing. And all I can describe, the only thing, the only way I can describe it is Jesus.
series I'm going into, and then I'm going to let you guys go. The series I'm going into uh, this month is you're doing it all again. I don't know, I know where many of us are. I don't know the exact details of your life. But I believe that the world, that even this, in this area, this church, our people, everyone is in a process of rebuilding. We are looking at where things are. We have recognized that things have gone crazy. But what I decree and declare over this house is that the same God that delivered uh, the people of Israel, the same God that caused the walls of Jericho to come down, the same God that has protected the, the Israel as they walked away from Egypt is the same God that will put the pieces back together in your life. The same God that will put the pieces back together in every ministry. The same God that will put the pieces back together of your personal businesses. The same God will put back the pieces of your heart together for lost loved ones. We had a phrase that says, if you did it before, you can do it again. And so I'm speaking that over this and over this moment, over this house, that he's doing it all again. Can you clap your hands and give God a praise here? Before you take your seats, let's pray. Before you take your seats, let's pray. Can you open up your heart to the Lord? Lift up your hands, even in your homes. Lift up your hands right now. Father, we, your people, we are called by your name. Lord, hear. Lord, forgive. For we bear your name. And Jesus, just as you told the people in the temple that if they would tear it down, in three days you would rebuild. They were thinking about the physical building, but you were talking about the spiritual temple. And I believe on today, Father, that you are going to decree and declare a word in here that's going to rebuild some hearts, that's going to encourage those that are broken down and disheartened, Father, that you are here and that you are God that comes through right in the nick of time. We honor you and glorify you. Speak, Father, your servants here. We want to hear what you have to say, not what DJ has to say, not what anyone else has to say but you, Father. Quiet our hearts, quiet our minds. Still the voices in our hearts and our minds that are contrary to your word. Confirm some things in us and through us, and we give you glory now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One more time. Clap your hands and give God some praise. Yeah. You can have your seat. Our church, this is, we are going into our seventh year anniversary. We are going into our seventh year anniversary and we won't deny no one will deny that it is much different than it was all the years past that things are not the same but the reality is you are not the same you're not the same individual that you were five years ago a year ago seven years ago you are just not the same God continues to do the wonderful, the miraculous in our lives. And whether we know it or not, have you, have you ever, let me, let me give you a scenario, let me give you an example. Have you ever been around someone in the house with someone uh, that was losing weight, but they were, you see them every day and you don't realize that they're actually losing weight until you depart from them for a while and you come back and you're like, wow. Because the change is happening right before your eyes and most often what's right before your eyes, you miss it, you miss it. My, my, my grandmother used to say, if it was a snake, it would have bit you. 
Because the things that God desires to do, even I'm here, here to let you know that the things that God is doing in your life, if you would just reflect back, if you would just think back, you will realize that he's been making changes in your life all along. There are so many people that are looking at the year 2020 and looking at all the devastation, all the destruction, all the despair, every single D you want to put in there, it's there. Uh, you turn on the news and there is no more good news, it's all bad news. Everywhere, everywhere you look, everything you read, it's all seemingly bad news. God is saying, even this, I'm able to take even this and turn it all around there. There, there are those that think that, man, I've wasted an entire year. I've been robbed of an entire, someone just told me I've been robbed of an entire year. I'm here to let you know that, <laughs> that God, we serve a God that, 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 that will restore the years. We serve a God that's not confined to time. He stands outside of time and he can orchestrate things in time and he can do more in a minute second than we could do all year long. I'm here to let you know that those that feel like your days have been robbed, that your time has been robbed, I'm here to let you know that God can turn it all around. He can do it again. He can turn it all around. I, 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 I'm, 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 I'm a witness because that, that last accident that I told you, it was a car that I loved. I mean, I, I loved my car, I loved, and, and it was, it, it wasn't, it wasn't super fancy, it was a simple Chrysler 300, but it was my favorite car. It was one that I loved. And in a split second, it was taken from you. You ever had those moments where in a split second, things changed in your life? Uh, information came to you and it changed your mind. It changed the trajectory. It changed your disposition. It changed everything in your life all in one second. Now, I won't, I won't, I won't uh, liken and compare the vicissitudes of life to the loss of a car, but the point that I'm trying to make is in a millisecond, the one thing that I thought I loved, uh, that, I, that I really uh, uh, had a love for, uh, was taken from me. And God says, don't worry about that, son, because in less than a month, I had the option of the same car, the same exact car. It was a random lot that a friend of mine connected me to. I went uh, to get another car and I show up at the lot, y'all, and I'm here to let you know the same year, the same color, the same look, and the same uh, features on the inside. Everything is sitting right there for me to get again. Y'all know what? Here's the, here's the crazy thing. If God was to give you back what you lost or give you the option to take back some of the things that you lost or get it back, uh, even a new one just like it, you won't want it. What that tells me is that we're more uh, desiring to have a pity party. Let, let, me get to, let me get to my text. I want to I deal with a, a wonderful topic on this morning. If you could turn with me in your Bibles really quickly to Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1. I want to read about four verses and then I'm going to jump over to Nehemiah chapter 2. And I want to read two verses there, verse 17 and 18. Nehemiah chapter 1, I want to read verses 1 to 4, and it says this. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, it came to pass in the month of Shizlev, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the citadel, that Hananiah, one of my brethren, be, be mindful of Shizlev, be mindful of Hananiah, that Hananiah, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah. And I asked him concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity. You might complain about it, you might not like it, but I'm here to let you know that you survived it. 
I want you to just take a, a, a big breath in and, and exhale out. And that, uh, that, that's awareness for you that you survived it. You might have been held captive. You might have been uh, going, you might have gone through some stuff, but you survived it. He's asking about who had survived the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates are burned with fire. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And it goes on into it, his discussion with the Father, his prayer. Turn with me over to Nehemiah 2, 17 and 18, and it says this, Then I said to them, You see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste and its gates are burned with fire. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. Verse 18, it says, and I told them the, the hand of God, hand of my God, which had been upon me and also the king's word that he had spoken to me. And here's the last point. It says, so they said, let us rise up and build. These are people that were captive. These are people that have survived such devastation. These are people who have lost everything. I'm here to speak to somebody and let you know that the grand of the work of God is laid before you and the, for a short period of time, I want to talk to you and challenge you this morning to get up and build. Get up and build. If I could give you, I don't often use a subtitle, but this morning, the subtitle that I have is, Will All the Nehemiahs Stand Up? Will all the Nehemiahs stand up? So, 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 so if I could, I would like to start off today with this axiom, this truth about the Lord. I've always, I've grown to love starting out with a truth about God. It helps us to build foundation about what he desires for us to know about him. And this is the one truth that I came up with on today. That truth is God is so clutch. I didn't get no response there. I, 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 I don't believe y'all even understand what that means. Maybe, maybe that's what it is. Maybe they don't understand what that means. You don't know what that means? Oh, okay, good. I'm going to help somebody. God is so clutch. He is the only one here. Here's what it is. He is the only one that can step into any situation and turn any defeat into victory. He's the only one that can step into any situation regardless to what the situation is, regardless to the circumstance. He doesn't have to ride up and say, let me assess the condition. Oh, I got to go back and get this tool and get that tool. Or, oh, I got to send you over there. God always shows up. And when he shows up, he's always so clutch. He always comes through no matter what we are facing. Now, do I have any witnesses here? Do I have any witnesses online that says God is so clutch? If you believe that, just type that in the chat. God is so clutch. If you believe that in here, just shout it out. God, you're so clutch. I love it. God, you are so clutch. God masters in the repair of everything that is broken. He masters he is a mastermind at the ability of, of taking every situation and bringing reparation to it. 
It doesn't matter how bad we think it is. It doesn't matter how big we think that mountain is. It doesn't matter how many bits and pieces you believe that is broken into. He can take any situation and bring repair to it. There is a theological name and descriptor that we use for that. Uh, God is so clutch. There's a, a theological descriptor. Maybe you might identify with this one, and that is he is El Shaddai. He is God Almighty. Yeah, you bring your problem, yeah, he's God Almighty. He's bigger than that. You bring your problem, yeah, he's God Almighty. He's bigger than that. There is nothing that he is incapable of solving in your life. Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. It's El Shaddai. He's an ever-present help in time of trouble. He's ever present in our lives and what, what seems like at first, uh, uh, what may be our first time contending with something so painful and something so destructive, I'm here to let you know he's mastered at pandemics. He's mastered at pestilence. He's mastered at handling floods. Huge bodies of water he, he separated, allowing his people to walk through. He is a mastermind at dealing with our problems. The question is, do you give it to him? Or do you try to fix it yourself? Lady always gives me a hard time because, uh, uh, you know, I tell her, I say, huh, you give me no respect. Um, I got tools. Why y'all laughing? Her dad was just here the uh, last week, and he asked me for, week before, he asked me for a screwdriver. He said, you have a screwdriver? I said, Psh. yeah, man, I got a screwdriver. You know, he asked me five years ago, I might have been like, I don't know, let me search through one of these drawers. I think there was one here when we moved in. But now I got power tools and all that kind of stuff. But the, here, here's my problem. I don't know how to always use them when they're there. There are times when Greg and I even are working on something, and he'll come in looking at me while I'm sitting here with, with a screwdriver or something doing like this. He's like, he picks up the power drill, and he says, move. And I'm like, I knew that. So it happened again the other day uh, when, when, when Lady's father asked me for a screwdriver. I ran downstairs, went onto my work desk, because I remember seeing a screwdriver in my pen holder. Mind you, I have an entire toolbox sitting that was sitting that I had to bypass the room for to go downstairs. An entire toolbox with power tools. I have all kinds and sizes of drills. I, I have an impact uh, 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 screw, uh, what, what do you call it? Impact drill and all these different things. And I run downstairs and I come back with this little screwdriver and I say, here you go. And he starts, I said, see dad, you know, Frida doesn't give me any credit. I got tools. And she thinks I don't know what I'm doing, but I know what I'm doing. I got, I got tools. And she, he says, yeah, he laughed. He said, yeah, I normally, I, I don't deal with these things. I have my, 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 uh, my automatic. I have my, my, my drill. And I was, oh, I got drills, Dad. I got drills. Let me go get it. I can get it. <laughs> you see, in our finite thinking, we believe that we have what it takes to fix things that only God can fix for us. We might say, let me try to use this one. Let me try to use that one. And he says, I just need you to get out of the way. He says, I just need you to get out of the way. So I want to deal with the fact that there is a problem right now. There is a spirit of mourning. I don't know if some of you can feel it that's just like all over the nation whether we're mourning about the government or mourning about the loss of loved ones, mourning about 
and, and concerned about whether we're sick or not, mourning about all kinds of things. Maybe you lost a business. Maybe you, maybe you lost a job. Maybe, you, maybe you're just mourning because you've lost time and you're looking at all the things that have transpired this year. I'm here to let you know that Jesus preached a powerful message, and it was interesting to me. I never noticed it before until I was studying for this particular message. But uh, uh, he, he he preached a powerful message uh, on the. It's called the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. You know, it, the Beatitudes, and he said this one thing. He says, "Blessed are they that mourn." And I stopped right there. I said, "Wait a minute." Jesus literally, I want, to, I want to help somebody, Jesus literally linked blessing with mourning. Oh, you thought mourning was just a bad thing. He will turn everything around to work out for your good. He's even linked blessing to mourning, a mourning to blessing, because he says, for they shall be comforted. They shall be comforted. Jesus quoted even in Isaiah 61 as he preached in Luke 4. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty. Somebody say liberty. To proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery. Somebody say recovery. Recovery of the sight of the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. He came to deal with your problem. Why? Because God is so clutch. I wish I, could, I wish I could get the response of how I'm feeling it today. I'm here to let you, never mind, never mind, never mind. Y'all going to get it in a minute. I, I, I want to give you some of this background. Nehemiah, Nehemiah is a cupbearer. He's a king to the king. He's a cupbearer to the king, King uh, Artaxerxes. Um, this position was a position of trust. It was a, it was a position of companionship. It, it was a position of influence. It was a position of privilege. Nehemiah is a Jew serving in the king of Persia's place. He's at work when he's confronted by Hanani, which is short for Hananiah. As I was studying this, I came across something that was so powerful to me, and that is Hanani literally means Yahweh has been gracious. Hanani shows up with bad news, but Hanani shows up along with the grace, because grace is built into who he is. Grace is built into his name. So the message that the Lord is here to let you know is you might be confronted with bad news, but guess what also just showed up? It says, my grace also showed up. And so even though you might have something that you think is irreparable, you might have something that you think uh, you've lost for forever, I'm here to let you know that grace is there. And then I went on and I saw uh, Nehemiah, and Nehemiah means Yahweh comforts. So Hananiah shows up with the bad news, but the grace of God also showed up when Hananiah showed up. <laughs> and then Nehemiah sits down and he mourns, but his very name means Yahweh comforts. So Nehemiah sat down in his blessing. Blessed are they who mourn, <laughs> for they shall be what? Comforted. Nehemiah means Yahweh comforts. So Nehemiah got the bad news, 
But along with the bad news, grace showed up. He responded with mourning to the bad news, but in his response, his response was there because also comfort was there. Nehemiah, you are a walking blessing to every moment in your life you mourn. And I'm just calling for all the Nehemiahs to stand up, those that are mourning, those that are going through, just to know that even your mourning is a blessing. Even your mourning is blessing your life. Even your mourning is changing your situation. Even your mourning. And I get Nehemiahs to stand up. Then I looked at just how prophetic this was, and I said, wow. Now, when I went on, I knew that this story was one of the first ones that I wanted to deal with. But I had no idea of the things that were, that were so packed into it. And I began to get encouraged, and I said, God, you're speaking. Because I went on and I studied the next word, which is chislev or kislev. The text starts out with, with in the month or at the time of Kislev. That this name, that this, this message that Hanani shows up with this news, Kislev, refers to a time period on the Jewish calendar that's leading into November. <laughs> it's October. Y'all sleep, maybe. I'm, I'm going to talk to y'all over here. I hear some people over here. Kislev refers to the moment that we're stepping into. And so for everyone that thought that you had lost it all, that you might be facing bad news, I'm here to let you know that grace shows up, and even in your morning, comforting is here. And guess what? This is the time to rebuild. I need anyone that's ready to get up. I need all the Nehemiahs to get up up and build in your home. If you're Nehemiah, I need you to get up. Get up, get up, get up, get up. Get up. Get up. It's a time frame that's associated with the Jewish calendar and I'm looking at this and I'm saying, man, the time frame is about the time frame that we're in right now. Nehemiah, I I'm dealing with the mourning of that, that that people are dealing with over this year and Nehemiah literally, see, literally means God, Yahweh comforts Jesus has already linked comfort, mourning with comfort. In other words, all of this is prophetic, and I'm saying, God, you're about to do something, and I just need I just two or three of y'all that believe that God is about to change some things in your life, that God can take the impossible situation and turn it around, that God is so clutch. I need you to get up and build. Get up and build. Nehemiah has been given this news and it shattered him. There's been no shortage of that. He was given this news and I can imagine that at this news, this is, this is back home. He's hearing about what has happened back home, about his family and about his neighborhood and and I'm sure he can imagine and re reflect back and say, man, I remember the days I used to be outside playing. I remember the days and times where I could look all around me and see the walls of my city. I remember the days where I looked at, even, even I reflect back, even I would think back and I look at the times where I said, God, you've always been there. I look at Jerusalem. Jerusalem refers to the people of God. It refers to the place of God. It refers to the presence of God. Jerusalem is a place of sacrifice. Jerusalem is a place of worship. Jerusalem is a place that everything that we are dealing with is being challenged right now. We can't come to church without face masks on. We couldn't come to church at all for a while couldn't gather together in a building to honor the Lord. The enemy was threatening the burning down, the tearing down of walls and the burning of the gates. Nehemiah is dealing with this. He's looking at 
a place that was once a place of worship, of sacrifice, and of power. The scripture says that he immediately sat down and he mourned, he wept, and he mourned. But then it says he fasted and he prayed. Nehemiah had a vision and a burden for the people of God to be restored and for the walls of Jerusalem to be restored. So in pursuit of God, he sought him for an answer. He says, I want to be a part of this rebuild because I feel a rebuild in my spirit. I'm, I'm letting you know, I feel a rebuild right here in my spirit. I feel a rebuild that is not too late, that things are not too disoriented and dis, disjointed, but, but God can come in and he can change any situation. And so I am turning to the only one that always shows up in the clutch. I'm showing up to pray and to fast and I believe that this atmosphere is a this kind of moment where Jesus says that yeah you might have tried it your old way but I'm here to let you know that this kind only comes through fasting and pr this moment is a this kind type of moment well, we won't be able to just get on up and go about our merry way. Some things have already changed, and because things have changed, it's going to require that we change. It's going to require that we give more. It's going to require that we do more. It's going to require that we are more devoted to who he is and to his work in our lives. I'm sure there were moments... And I don't know about those times, but I can imagine there being moments where some were hanging out around the gates. Some were hanging out just talking while they were looking because nothing ever happens around the gates. I'm sure that there were moments and times where they came into the city of Jerusalem and they took the walls for granted. I'm sure there were moments and times where they came into Jerusalem and they didn't even recognize the walls. They went straight on to their own priorities in business. God is letting you know that he's pulling back all the things that you used to rely on, the things that you used to uh, put your confidence in to say, ah, the gates, those walls, all of those things have been torn, been torn down, but I'm changing some things. And now you'll no longer rely on the walls and the gates, but you'll rely on me. You'll no longer rely on the walls and the gates, but you'll rely on me. Nehemiah had in his heart to go back home, and he needed favor from Art King Artaxerxes to go back home to rebuild because he had a day job. He's like me. He had a day job, but he also had a greater passion for the people and the presence of God. And so he says, I need the favor of my boss so that I can go home and handle your work, Lord. It's interesting to me that Nehemiah, all his life and all this time, he's the cupbearer. He has so much influence, and the only thing he's concerned about is his people and the presence. You see, our problem, maybe the reason why some of us aren't so blessed, aren't as blessed as we should be, is because we are willing to give the glory and the tension, attention, the time to the blessing instead of the blesser. And so sometimes he uses, Paul even said it, Paul told us in 2 Corinthians that sometimes he uses mourning, he uses a, a sorrow to cause you to turn. Y'all didn't know that that was there, huh? Oh, I'm sorry, but it's there, it's there, it's in the text. He uses, at times, uh, the scripture says that he uses in 2 Corinthians 7 and 10, God can use the presence of sorrow to help us to change our way, ways to leave sin and to seek salvation. He says, I want you to leave all the things that you have false sense of security in, and I need you to turn them to me. You see, when Nehemiah and the people went to build, first off, let me give you the points. The first thing that, and in these last four minutes that I have, the first point is that Nehemiah, that we can learn from him, is that Nehemiah had a heart for the people and the place. 
of his presence. Verse 4 says that when he heard these things, he sat down and he wept and he mourned for many days. You see, the very first, his very first response was indicative that he had a heart for those things. Because he was sitting up in a palace. He was sitting up. He had it nice. He, he was sitting up in the palace. He had a, a, a place of a prestige. He had a, a, the favor of the king. He could even be the silent and the back uh, 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 guidance to the king. Because the king would trust the cupbearer. The cupbearer would taste everything before giving it to the king. And so the king would say, cupbearer, Nehemiah, what you think? Nehemiah was the one that would just put his life at risk for everything that the king was about to do. Everyone else had all sorts of fancy titles, but the king would look at Nehemiah and say, what do you think? I'm here to let you know because you bear the name of the Lord, even though you might be going through, even though you might be faced with some difficulties, uh, you can look at God and say, God, what do you think? God will look at you and he say, what do you think? Jesus looked at the disciples and he says, who do men say I am? And they started giving all kinds of other things. And he says, but wait a minute. I want to know about the ones that are closest to me, the ones that declare that they are my disciples. Who do you say I am? What do you think? Jesus wants to know what you think. He wants you to look at everything that's around you and then he's going to ask you, what do you think? Do you think that I'm more than able? I love this about Nehemiah. Nehemiah. Nehemiah's response shows that he had a vision for better and he had a vision, a vision for greater for uh, his people and his presence. Uh, and he had a heart for it, but at the same time, he wasn't willing to stay there. I want to deal with that for a quick moment because there's so many that are mourning, but they are unwilling to get up. They are still sitting down, and they're on the seat of do nothing. They are mourning. They are, woe is me. I lost my dog. Woe is me. This has happened to me. But we're still sitting in mourning. And he's saying, how long will you mourn over Saul? How long will you mourn? over the thing that I'm not even doing anything in any longer. I've moved on and I'm doing a new thing, but how long are you going to mourn? He said, it's all right to mourn, but don't mourn too long. You got to change that thing. You got to make a decision that you're going to fast and that you're going to pray because there are some things that only come through by fasting and prayer. There are some things because what fasting does is moves you out of the way. Fasting is a place of humility. Fasting hunger is one of the greatest signs and forms of humility. When someone is hungry, they are also humble because they are looking at this thing. I know when I was growing up, my, my mom used to tell me, uh, if you're hungry, you're going to eat what's set before you. And I might say, I don't want that. And she said, yeah, you're going to want it after a while. And before, they, before I left that table, the plate was empty because I ate what was set before me. I might not have wanted what was on the plate, but I ate what was on the plate because what was on the plate was good for me. It might not have been good to me, but it was good for me. I need somebody in here that says, that can say, thank God for making me eat the plate. Thank God for making me eat what you have set before me. I might not have liked it. It might have hurt. It might have felt bad, but I know you're not here about my feelings. You're here about your purpose and plan for my life. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the second thing that Nehemiah had was a wealth of wisdom in prayer and fasting. Uh, the second uh, ver uh, uh, verse number five says, and, and I prayed to the Lord. I didn't read this one uh, within our text, but verse number five says, uh, and I prayed to the Lord God of heaven. Oh, great and awesome God. He says, you're El Shaddai. He says, you are clutch. You who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments. What he did was right in the moment he was dealing with the news that he was dealing with, he pulled back and he says, yeah, but the God that I serve, God, you had a promise over my life and over your people 
and you said that, 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 that I am the head and not the tail. You said and that you are covenant-keeping God and, and that you would never allow my foot to be moved and that you are always protecting me. I'm calling on that. See, some of us are, are rushing to prayer and we're going through and we'll pray out of routine, but we don't deal with the real things that we need God to do. And we get up and we walk off. Now the Holy Spirit makes intercession with groanings that cannot be uttered because there are many times we don't even know what to pray for as we all, God does things that we didn't even pray for because we didn't even think they're asking for it. What if, you got up from your place of mourning right now. No, like right now, right now. What if you made the decision today that my time, my period of mourning is over? Yeah, I might be still dealing with the news. Yeah, I might have to go and confront the news because when Nehemiah heard about it and he prayed. He went to, king, to the king and king, the king gave him permission and he went and confronted the problem. He went and he observed the walls that were torn down and the gates that were burned. He went and he wept and he looked at it and he says, we're going to fix this thing. And I'm going to fix it because the hand of the Lord is upon me. It's not by happenstance that Jesus said uh, in his first message that the hand, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me. I'm here to let you know that the Spirit of the Lord, the hand of God is upon you. And the very things that you're dealing with, he's already equipped you with what's necessary to address the issues and to rebuild, but you have to do it with him and through him. You cannot do it in your own strength. What if your next prayer, think about this, what if your next prayer could literally change the trajectory of the world right now? Some of us might be saying this is a little bit out, a little bit far-fetched and out of reach and pastor, can you be realistic? But I believe the whole word of God. And I believe that if he did it before, he's also doing it all again. Nehemiah prayed about a situation and God gave him what was needed to accomplish the mission. There were people that had lost their homes. Nehemiah didn't just mourn and weep over his own lost loved ones and his ancestors or he didn't just mourn and say, you mean to tell me my vacation house is gone? Back home? Can you check this address? Is that address still there? He took personal responsibility. If you will read that prayer, he took personal responsibility. His heart was for God, but he says, Father, we have fallen short. We've sinned. He didn't say your people. They did. He said we. And his concern was not about his own well-being, but it was about the well-being and what God had already promised. Seeing that come to pass, could it be that we are still where we are as a church and as a body because we are too focused on ourselves? But if you will posture yourself one more time in prayer, it could be that the very next time you go to the Father in fasting and prayer, that literally be the one that changes everything around you. His response lets us know that Nehemiah held God's word and guidance as priority. He didn't just mourn and then say, what am I going to do about it? He says, no, I got to fast and go to the Lord. That's one of the things I love about, about even Marina. There are sometimes I talk to even Marina and she says, you know, Pastor, we, we, have, we have to pray. How many times do you call somebody and the very first thing they say is, you know, we, we have to pray. 
They're more apt to say, well, what happened? What? And you know this is blah, blah, blah. And you know where they were. And you know what they did. And you know what happened. I saw them the other day. I was on their page. I, I saw that post. I did this. And they liked it. Have you looked? Have you scrolled down? Did you see the comment? Not one word about prayer has come out of your mouth. Could it be that we're just all focused? I'm here to let you know in this season, if we're going to rebuild, that just won't cut it. Time for that is over. Time for that is over. Time out for the nonsense. It's time to focus in and put and keep the main thing the main thing. How long are you going to say, I'm going to get it right, but not today? Not right now. How many times does he have to show you the things that need to be corrected in your life before you say, you know what? Consider it done. Father, what do you want me to do for your kingdom? You know what the walls that the, the temple Jerusalem represents? I said it represents the people of God, right? It also represents the place of God, the people of God. We are his temple, right? If we are his temple, if you're liking it to that point in time, we're like the walls of Jerusalem that have been torn down. And he's saying, if you would allow me, I can rebuild everything. I can restore the years that the palmer worm and the canker worm and the locust and all of those have eaten and have taken away and the time that you thought you've lost, I can do more outside of time and cause to happen right in the nick of time than you could do in any moment and period of time. Nehemiah recognized that there was a better place and it wasn't just talking about it. He wasn't just looking at it and saying, well, well, is this, is that person there? Have you seen so-and-so? Have you did this? What about my old house? What about the street I used to live on? He says, it's time to fast and pray. Because now what's at stake is the promise of God being fulfilled through us in our generation. I think some of y'all missed it. Some of us are still working to fulfill things that generations before us should have been done. But God is saying, my promise is still my promise. I'm just looking for a people. So I'm still looking for a people. What kind of people, Pastor? I'm so glad you asked. My last point is Nehemiah not only knew when to mourn, when to weep, when to pray, when to fast, but Nehemiah also knew when to get up. He knew when to get up. In this moment in our lives, we are encouraging others. Are we encouraging others to get up or are we struggling to encourage ourselves? But you're the people of the promise. So are you encouraging others or are you in need of encouragement right now? Sometimes, if you're waiting on someone else, sometimes you have to encourage yourself in the Lord. You have to encourage yourself. Creation is groaning. Waiting. For those that know who they are, to get up. Even we within ourselves are groaning within ourselves because we're still mourning and we haven't decided to get up. So despite all this bad news, Nehemiah's strength and comfort came from his mourning. He mourned, therefore it comforted him. 
he knew how to handle conflict. Y'all remember, some of y'all that were here remember, I, I, I talked about comfort and being too comfortable in the presence of God, and I, I, I used this chair, for example, I had this chair on the stage, and I said, one of the biggest challenges and problems that keeps us from going further in God, and I pointed to the chair, because it's a place of comfort. We don't know how to manage comfort. Maybe, you're, maybe you don't have peace because you haven't figured out how to manage comfort. Because if you're mourning, comfort, comfort is already there. So you have to ask yourself, am I handling it the right way? Am I helping anybody? It's hard to tell with these masks on, you know. So Nehemiah was not, not only did he know when to get up, but he encouraged others to get up. If you notice uh, from our text, verse, uh, ch chapter 2, verse 17 uh, and 18, verse 17, he was telling people to observe what was happening around them. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you to observe what's happening around you. And now he says, I encourage you to get up and let us build. And by the time you got to verse 18, the people's response to each other was, let's get up. Let us rise and build. You have what you need to build because you have the Father. He's everything you need. Can you rise to your feet here? Everyone, can you rise? As a matter of fact, I want all the Nehemiahs to get up. Because this place that we're entering into right now, the space that we're in, it requires Nehemiahs. It's in need of those that are willing, that, are, that, that won't be so discouraged by the devastation around them that they sit down and stay down. But he's looking for Nehemiahs that says, Father, whatever you need me to do, I'm not worried about a building. I'm not worried about this or that. I've lived through this. I am a survivor of this captivity. I am a survivor of the walls being torn down and all that has happened and transpired. And because I am a survivor, I know without a shadow of a doubt that you didn't save me for nothing. Do you think that you're still here out of sheer luck? I just want you to think about that for a minute. Right online, are you, do you think that you're here and you're able to plug in right now with this? Out of just happenstance, you just happen to be? God's divine providence orchestrated your being here now. Why? Because there are Nehemiahs needed in this moment. And he's looking for a people that says, I'm ready to get up and do whatever it takes. It's not about me. It's not about the building that I'm in. It's not about the ministry that I'm connected to, but it's about the work that God has assigned to his people. So it doesn't matter whether you're working on uh, 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 the, uh, the first gate, the second gate, this gate, that gate. I just want to be in, in the walls. I want to be a part of the rebuild. Here's what's going to be needed. Here's the challenge. Like I said, things are different. When Nehemiah and the people went to build the walls, they built the walls and then they built the gates. You know, the walls were made of brick and mortar and all of those kind of things and they had a certain height. But the gates were made of wood. And this is why the scripture says that the walls were torn down and the gates were burned. You see, those gates could not be repaired. Those gates had to be replaced. <laughs> you 
You see, the enemy might be looking at you trying to put, just like the adversary was looking at Nehemiah and all those people as they tried to rebuild, and he, they started to ridicule them and say, look at them, what are they doing? Think about it. I want you to think about it. You've, you've lost a lot. You've lost a lot. Even if what you've lost was sleep, you've lost a lot. But could it be that the things that you lost are because they need to be replaced? Let me help somebody. There were 12 gates to Jerusalem. There were 12 gates, but the problem was along the way of rebuilding, they could not replace all of the gates. They only repaired about six to eight gates. The whole point of the walls and the gates was to, was to protect them from the enemy. I'm going somewhere real quick, real quick. Could it be, could it be that the gates that remained open was an indication that you can no longer rely on the things made by man, but you're going to really have to rely on me. I believe that we're all coming to the awareness now that we can't rely on man anymore. There's a lot of discussion about who to vote for and vote for this one. And I don't want to vote for any one of them, to be honest. I don't even care anymore because my destiny doesn't depend on them. Well, Pastor, you should stand up and vote and you should care. For what? I'm not putting my trust in man. My trust is only in the Lord. I've learned my lesson. I have a gate open and I'm not filling it with somebody else. I'm filling it with the Lord because he's the only one he is my refuge, my fortress, my God, and him will I trust. I'm not trusting in anything else, in anyone else. I'm not trusting in anything or anyone. I'm only trusting in the Lord. Trust thou in the Lord. So could it be that the gates that were burned down in your life, quit trying to repair them. They need to be replaced. And the only suitable tool and solution that's necessary for that gate is called his presence. It's called his will. It's called his way. It's called everything that you need, you find it in him. Lift your hands to the Lord. Father, we love you. We stand before you. We lift up our eyes to the hills from which cometh our help. Our help comes from the Lord. We lift up our eyes. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. You are a gate. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up. And the King of glory shall come in. Father, we're lifting up our gates. We're lifting up our heads, saying, Father, we want you to feel we chose today. We made a decision today that we're no longer going to stay seated, but we're going to get up. We're going to lift up our gates for you to feel, Lord. Have your way in us, Lord. Father, we thank you even for the process of mourning because we know that blessing is attached to it. That everything, it doesn't matter whatever we face, you're always so clutch. We glorify you now, for, for Father, for those that even may be challenged with this message, this very message in this moment. Maybe there's some that are struggling with the message. Maybe there's someone that is struggling that says, yeah, but Pastor, you don't understand what I've gone through. Maybe I don't, but Father, we know that you do. And so, Father, speak to their hearts now. Say only what you can say. Bring the comfort that only you can bring. Let us not put our trust and our faith and our hope and our confidence in man. But Father, we look to the hills from which cometh our help. 
our help comes from you. Help them to realize that their help comes from you. And that they can get up from this. We can get up from this. That if you did it before, not you can, but you are doing it all again. We give you honor and glory for it now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Clap your hands. Wasn't that a powerful word and awesome worship encounter? Now it's time to give. We have more than one way of giving here at House. First, you can text how and the amount that you would like to give to 28950. Or you can give online at www.howchurchonline.org. You can also give right in our app by clicking How I Give. We want to thank you so much for joining us today. We can't wait to see you next week. Remember, if you'd like to register to worship for an in-person encounter, the link goes out Monday at noon, so make sure you move fast because these seats fill up pretty quickly. Well, Hal fam, that's it. Thank you so much for joining us once again, and we'll see you next week.